So I'm going to rush through um, a number of slides here that describe a new project that is well, well underway, opportunity to um, collaborate with others on campus. The slides are available, so you can look at the details um, as I go through it. I'm going to break this into three parts, uh, background in the R&D context for this, a bit about the facility itself, and then our current plans and partnerships and where we're headed. Um, I don't need to re remind you or to just restate the fact that buildings are the biggest part of U.S. energy consumption, and in particular because of electricity here, about three quarters of electricity in the focus of the uh, rest of the afternoon here or the rest of the day, buildings are crucial. The, the breakdown on the right that you can't see just breaks uh, at the, the end uses of both residential and commercial into all the different pieces and parts, and it sort of argues that you can't just solve one single problem. You have to attack the building's issue at many different levels, uh, and, and that's one of the, the reasons for this kind of facility. If we step back and look at achieving the broad DOE goals, the DOE goals were stated and restated a number of different ways. George is here from DOE today. He could throw in his own definition, but variously net zero, variously 50% savings. But in the long run, if you, need, if you want to achieve the, the, the carbon savings that we need as a society, you need to be um, producing savings that are well beyond anything that's a, a, attained routinely today. And you can break this problem up in a lot of ways. I've broken it up into the technology and systems piece on the left side, and then the operations uh, and, and life cycle piece on the other side. And one needs to be operating across this full spectrum if you're going to have the kind of impact that we're talking about. And I'm going to show in a few minutes how this test bed facility is going to try and address some of these. Now, one way of looking at the problem is how are we doing today? <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a set of um, data both predicted data and measured data from a set of about 100 buildings. On the lower axis here, I guess I have a uh, lower axis here was the energy use per square foot. The US average is about 90. The predictions are along here. And the achieved measured values after the building is built is up here. And you see a couple of things, obviously. You see a huge scatter, which means we don't do a very good job of operating buildings in sync with what we predicted they would use. There's a, lots of reasons for that. That's a whole separate talk. But most important is the buildings that weren't very good to begin with, with high EUIs, they ended up performing a bit better. This is the 1.0 line. Anything, if, if all, all the points perfectly aligned, they'd all be along this line. But when you get to the most efficient buildings, the predicted most efficient buildings down here, they barely meet expectations, and most of them are 50% or even 100% greater than they, than, than they were intended. So there's a systematic problem here in the ability to integrate systems and achieve desired performance. So if we step back for a second, we, we do know how to achieve on the top piece here. We do know how to retrofit lights or improve motors and, and change out windows and achieve 5 to 20% savings. What we don't do a very good job at is doing things with integrated building systems and achieving the 50% savings or greater that we're going to need to achieve those goals. And you can understand this. We're talking more about the commercial sector here than the residential sector. But if you take a look at, let's see, I've got a couple of other pieces here. At the major systems in these buildings, you've got the envelope, you've got lighting, you've got HVAC. There are components within each that interact with each other. The three major systems interact with each other. Net performance is the sum or integration of all of these, and I've got some of the grid supply there on the, or the on-site on grid supply on the roof there. This is a, a moderately complex problem, and it's a complex problem both in the science and engineering side and, of course, also in the business side. And on the business side, if you look at cost, buildings are always constrained by cost. Uh, the classic view of a piece of the building or piece of the building is looking at its component elements, heating, cooling, and lighting, and you look at cost, you look at savings, you look at payback. But in fact, the decisions we make about lighting HVAC, or let's say lighting an envelope here, ripple through to driving chiller size. And chiller size is a huge first cost in buildings, and chiller size in turn drives the need for power. So there's investments being made here and being made here, and the challenge is, can I make an investment here and trade off dollars improved systems here for cost over here and over here. If you ask a licensed engineer whether they'll downsize the chiller because the simulation tool says the building will need 30% less, less cooling, most licensed engineers will defer and say, sorry, next year or next time. And so we don't, we don't optimize the system in the red line here. We tend to, at best, optimize the system in, in the, line, in the uh, black line here. 
So what could we learn, sort of shifting now, can we solve some of these problems by looking at real data and real buildings? And the answer is of course, but it's complicated and expensive to, to actually do that. In some sense, every building is a test bed. You're doing a lot in this building, learning a lot about what works and what doesn't work. But in terms of being a little more flexible and being able to change things easily, you can't radically change the HVAC system in this building. You can't change environmental conditions because you would upset the people that work in the building. So the idea of having a, a test bed that replicates most m many aspects of the reality of real buildings, but is much more flexible both to optimize performance, validate tools, and ultimately guide new investment in the building industry. This is sort of the precursor to what we're talking about here. And let me give you some examples. I'm going to flip through these really quickly. But we've been doing this for about 20 years in a variety of areas where DOE has supported a robust program. So one of the areas is smart building skins. And this is a concept diagram for the work that's gone on here. Um, we built a facility, look at the dates here, 1985 operated, you don't, see, you don't see snow in the Berkeley Hills, this is Reno. So we put this in Reno, this is on wheels, it can rotate two side-by-side -side cal calorimetric chambers. Did a lot of studies of some of the early smart glass here, trade-offs of, of winter loss and solar gain. Um, we then borrowed a piece of a building, you'll recognize the Twin Towers, the Oakland Federal Building, downtown Oakland, look at the dates, 20 years ago. We completely gutted and retrofit a portion of the building, so we're in a building here, but we built our own test lab, tested the first electrochromics and a bunch of other things. The, we, we did some really interesting tests here with optimized blinds, and 10 years later, when the New York Times came to build its, its new headquarters building in New York City, they said, we want that automated shading and dimmable lighting um, you guys have done it in Oakland, can't we do it in New York City? And we said, well, we did it at 100 square feet, you're trying to do it at 1.5 million square feet, these things don't scale all that perfectly. So we convinced them to build a mock-up of their own. This is a 5,000 square foot mock-up, it was a quarter or a corner of their building in New York City. We brought in uh, 10 different companies that supplied blinds and shades. We tested this stuff extensively for a year, both human factors as well as um, uh, all the energy issues. We worked with the CBE group here on campus to extend from the envelope into the underfloor air system and eventually a building was in fact built and that building is operating pretty well now. We're back in that building measuring the real performance. So a test bed followed up by field measurements in the building. And based on that we built a new series of test beds on the hill. These were done in the last decade. Uh, you see the first uh, first version of them from 2003 to 6 with electrochromic windows, newer versions with automated shading, uh, three side-by-side -side chambers, uh, excellent control of the conditions inside, the ability to change out technology. We can explore the visibility issues inside as well as the energy issues. These are inside high dynamic range imaging. And then the last slide in this sequence is into, this is Washington, D.C., this is in the Department of Energy's own offices. Once you build some confidence in the technology, this is electrochromics, we installed it in the Assistant Secretary's office. That's a, a danger for a researcher to put a technology in, in the office of a person that manages your budgets, but it was put in there, it works reasonably well, although it's still some bugs in all this. And we aren't the only ones doing this. There's a group of about 20 organizations around the, country, around the world, sorry, that are using full-scale test facilities to understand these complex build, building dynamic problems. In fact, on Saturday, I'm going to a meeting in the UK where this group meets twice a year to share information about what they're doing. So with that as context and background, both problem and the past, we responded to an RFP from the Department of Energy a couple years ago uh, where they said, we want help in in building a facility or creating a capability to measure and model these kinds of things. And we developed, we're calling here a sort of Swiss Army knife facility that would do lots of different things for lots of different people, would be available as a user facility to a lot of different users, so this isn't just for LBL to use, this is for any qualified users. Um, through Recovery Act funding, we got 50, almost $16 million two years ago. We've spent the last year and a half doing the design. We've now started construction. The first element in the facility is coming online now. It'll be fully operational in about a year. So let me talk for a few minutes about the facility. It's outdoor testing. The real world climate is critically important, but we control uh, the environment. There's a series of test units, each can be split into two sections, so we can do side-by-side -side testing within one or we can compare this one to the ones adjacent to it, heavily instrumented and metered um, and highly flexible. 
uh, the, the, the lessons learned from the prior, th um, prior test beds I showed you were things like needing to do side by side. If you're doing anything with real time climate, if you're doing an indoor um, lab facility, you can test on Monday and then test the following week and compare Monday to Monday and because you hold things stable, you learn something. When you're doing things outdoor, the world is always changing. So side by side is important. Space type is important. Uh, before, we only had, in all the facilities I showed you, we had one zone depth. Well, a lot in a building goes on deeper than the outer 15 or 20 feet, so we've extended that to two zones. Most of the stuff I showed you before was one story. We have a two-story high base space here as well. We can do both engineering issues of energy, but we can put people in these spaces and measure occupant impacts as well. Um, this is an exploded view of what the facility can do, and this emphasizes the fact that the idea is you can take the pieces of parts and reassemble them. So we can change all the facade elements, all the HVAC elements, all the lighting elements. And this is what it will look like. This is the building we currently occupy, Building 90 up on the hill. There's a bunch of 30-year-old trailers here that will be demolished in the next month. There'll be one facility will rotate. Let me just put these on. One facility will rotate here. There's another uh, low base space here and here, and there's a two-story space in the middle. So there's these four spaces outside. There's two spaces inside. Uh, a big chunk of this floor, 3,000 square feet, is uh, a lighting and plug load lab. This will be occupied all the time, so there's a limit to what we can do there. Uh, but that, that facility is built now and will be started up very soon. There's a controls and visualization labs inside the building elsewhere. And we've been investing over a million dollars now in a data acquisition and control system for the building that will allow not only us but any users to operate the facility remotely so it's all internet based and adapting either their technology that they're bringing to control and monitor the system um, or using one that we would provide for them. We've had some discussions here with, with uh, David and others about using SMAP as some of the underlying technology here and want to do more collaboration there. There's a whole lot of, of detail going into this. I won't even try to get into this. But the main thing is we want to be able to, to work with someone who brings nothing but a product to the facility and we supply the entire controls and measurement infrastructure to someone who brings their own hardware, their own software, wants to do everything on their own and yet interface with our data acquisition system. So to kind of bring this to closure now, where are we going in terms of the next few months here? We've got another year's worth of construction ahead of us. Uh, we're working now with the industry, engaging industry in a, in a variety of ways to work with them on this project. Um, this kind of puts the user group we have in mind, and you see that it's a very diverse user group. It's obviously the R&D community, but beyond the R&D community, the people that make decisions about buildings, architects, engineers, and owners, people that invest in with the ma manufacturers in the technology, uh, code officials, the utilities in California spend a billion dollars a year investing in technology in new buildings. Um, and the theme here is to bring all of them into this lab-scale testbed. This is, sits somewhere in this stream between more basic R&D and bringing things at scale out into the real world. And we can, in fact, in terms of the different things that we do, we can operate al al along this scale. Um, the outcomes from this will depend on who it is we're talking to. An owner, frankly, doesn't want to hear too much about the details. They want to see uh, real evidence that the stuff works, for example. Uh, on the other hand, if you're an investor in a, in a startup, you want to know a lot more about the fundamentals to understand that the technology will really work compared to whatever's in the market today. The utilities are a key target for us because, at least in California, they have a huge investment in energy efficiency. And so what we're doing now is talking to individual companies. There are some examples here, a lighting company, an HVAC company, and some state agencies. And what, what would they do in the facility? What would they get out? What would they put in? And one of the uh, issues here, which is an interesting one for us, is DOE is building the facility, but the operating budget is still TBD. So we get funded by DOE generally on a year-by-year -year basis. This facility will be along, or will be around more than one year. So looking ahead, how you fund a facility, how you operate a, a facility intelligently and, and, and efficiently with year-to-year -year funding is a real challenge. We're talking to dozens and dozens of organizations, lots of interest. Everyone's interested. The real question is, will they engage or how will they engage? Will they write a check at some point if needed? 
So here's where we are with current funding. We're developing a five-year plan for DOE, which is this engagement plan, how we would use the facility. And it's got a you know, pre-planning construction phase shakedown in a couple of years of launch. We'll be bringing in some outside advisors to help us and to help DOE evaluate what we're doing. There's a lot of um, important but mundane M&O management and operations stuff. If you bring in a new uh, operate, if you bring in a new experiment, how do you set it up rapidly, efficiently, and safely? And then the other thing we're doing, which is interesting, encouraged by DOE, is to build a network of all the other research organizations doing things like this. I showed you the group of 20 overseas. There's a group of about 15 to 20 in the U.S. that are doing serious research in facilities around the country. This is just a scheme of the fourth floor. This is complete now. Uh, people are moving into it. Experiments will start soon. 3,000 square feet, about um, 12, uh, about 20 different uh, cubicles here, and we're doing some work with, with a couple of companies there. This is just a concept diagram over a year or so of things starting and stopping. So this is part of this M&O uh, issue of this time to set up, to calibrate, to, to install stuff, to calibrate stuff, to collect data, to analyze data, and so on. So there's a whole sequence and flavor of this that can get somewhat complicated over time as we start to work with different players. And, and these players we've already talked to have completely different interests. Some want to go in and do something for a month and leave, and others want to be in there for a year. Uh, some want to run things themselves, some want us to do it all for them. And this interest extends beyond uh, just the U.S. We've been approached by three organizations overseas. Singapore is one, and there's a lot of Singapore engagement here on campus. Um, they want to build versions or variants of FlexLab, uh, one in Europe, one in the Middle East, one in the Far East, which is interesting for us as well. So we're sharing what we've learned in the whole design here as well. Um, so last slide, um, we're particularly looking at, while we're building the facility and those of you that have been involved in building things know on a daily basis there's all kinds of RFIs and challenges and problems to be solved, but we're putting most of our effort this year into engagement with industry, and again, industry broadly interpreted here. So we're looking at both public sector and private sector. Um, we've been developing um, with people different kinds of horizontal and vertical partnerships. A horizontal partnership would be take 10 glass companies, find out what issues are common to all of them, bring them into the, into the picture as a, as a team and have them jointly fund pre-competitive pre or post-competitive R&D. Vertical partnership would be a glass company, a lighting company, an HVAC company, an owner, and a contractor, and get them to work on a project where, like something like with the New York Times, where you provide a complete solution and, and generate useful information. Um, I put my contact information. Uh, Cindy Renier runs a project on a day-to-day -day basis. Oren is involved. A lot of others. I think Marianne's in the in the audience here. Marianne. Piet is the head of the department and is heavily involved in this. So we've got a, a, a big team at the lab involved in all this work. Uh, contact any of us if you're interested in exploring how uh, you might get further engaged. There is a, on that website, flexlab.lbl.gov, is a 16-page brochure that lays out sort of use cases for how the facility would be operated. So we're very interested in engagement from any of you, from your respective organizations, and also from partners and, and collaborators that you might have as well. Thanks. Thank you, um, can, uh, questions? Or? Take questions, but before, um, uh, I'll, before we can answer questions, just want to let everybody know that the, all the presentations will be posted at the i for energy website you know, <laughs> a few days after today's uh, symposium. Um, the session, both sessions, morning and afternoon session, is going to be recorded. So, and that will be also posted on the YouTube uh, i for energy channel. So uh, if there are questions, please wait for me to hand the mic over to you. Okay. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Paul Wright uh, from Citrus. A quick reaction. When we tried to make, when we made this building a test bed, which we're using on a regular basis now, one of our biggest challenges was to try and find some kind of base line energy usage whilst the whole SWAT team of different groups were using the building. So doing what scientifically would be a controlled experiment was pretty hard to do, still is hard to do. So uh, what, what are you going to, what, what's, the, I want to learn from you what your plans are about how you would 
establishes so, that base for, right. for measurement. So we have, if we ignore, the, if we ignore that two-story space, we have three one-story spaces that are pretty much the same. Each of them could be divided in half. So we have either three or six things, six test beds that we could install side-by-side -side com comparative systems and study them. And in fact, the way we finally designed this is that one of those three will be built with 1970s uh, glazing lighting. It'll, it'll have single glazing with lousy aluminum frames, lousy lighting, lousy HVAC, the way a big part of the stock is today. The next one down will be 2010, so it'll meet current California code for Title 24 for 2010, double glazing, one watt per square foot, et cetera. And the third one will be a net zero solution. So out of the box, we will have three snapshots of timelines of real real buildings as a way to start. Now, again, in the end, the R&D agenda will be driven by who comes to the table, wants to do work. But you could set up because, so, so the, the, key, the key issue we have here that, we do, that you don't have in a real building is you can't create the replica to compare A to B in this building. You can't do it easily. This is a problem we all have too. We're doing about 20 buildings for DOE. We're in the field in measuring. So side by side comparisons. Then the other, the flip side of that is to say, okay, but you're in Berkeley and who cares about Berkeley because it's nice all year round. By simulation, we, we then validate simulation tools and then can extend the results from Berkeley to other places. So that's a challenge that we spend a lot of time thinking about and we think we have solutions to it. Thanks for the nice answer. Thank you. Yep. Yep. I have a question uh, regarding if there is any data about uh, the impact on the people. Like for example, in the productivity or the well-being, uh, how many days do they get sick a, a year, for example, uh, and you can make, and you can put a value to the well-being or the ha having a comfortable right. environment with energy. Sure. I think so, in this area it's going to be difficult because the weather is very nice, but. <laughs> right. So some <laughs> of the, so that's an, that's an area of great, interest to us. Some of the experts, world's experts in that area are at CBE here on campus. We have the ability in these facilities to make those measurements. The control algorithms for the New York Times for that million square foot building were developed by putting 40 people in the test bed, the, one of those test beds I showed you, and watched how they triggered the blinds. The question is, when should the blinds be triggered to control the radiation coming through the sunlight and the glare? And the answer is you can calculate and theorize, but you put 40 people in a space and you watch what they do in the real world and you develop an algorithm based on that. That's, that's where we solve that problem. Um, productivity and the economic costs of that are huge drivers. If you can prove it, I'm, I believe that there are real effects there. I also believe it's nearly impossible to bring them to the point where an investor will put up a lot of extra money because of a productivity increase. We can measure comfort more easily. We can measure satisfaction more easily. There are experiments. There's a pretty wide literature now on productivity, but it's a messy literature. And I'd suggest either talking to me afterwards or talking to the folks at CBE to learn more about those issues. We, we do have, as I mentioned, the fourth floor space is an occupied space. And that means that anything we do in that space has to be done very carefully. We go through human subjects approval here. Um, I would say from experience with the other facilities, 80 or 90 percent of what we'll do will be unoccupied spaces, but we've got the ability to bring people in as well and do those studies if we want to.